BMW Z1 is known as a crazy sports car BMW made in the late 1980s with those funky doors. But it's so much more than just funny doors you could play with all day until they broke. It was a symbol of BMW investing in their future at a time when cars, and particularly luxury cars, were relying more and more on technology rather than expensive materials such as leather or walnut. So why did BMW, a mass market car maker, want to hand build a car? And why did they stop making them after three years, after only 8,000 cars had been produced, when they'd got 35,000 orders? This is the BMW Z1 story. The 1980s were boom times for BMW. The 5 Series was selling well and was augmented by the smaller 3 Series and larger 7 Series. With more money, they set up a new department to focus on new technologies and designs, dubbed BMW Technic. In the 1980s, BMW was focusing on the performance prowess of its passenger cars, with the tagline, the ultimate driving machine. The BMW M1 was the first passenger car produced by the new M Sporting Division, and soon other cars would get the M treatment, such as the BMW M5. So it was natural the first design from BMW Technic would be an open-top sports car, the first since the disastrous BMW 507 in the 1950s. Elvis had bought one, but only 251 other cars were sold, costing the company dearly. With BMW Technic focusing on new design techniques and design production directions, the new Roadster wasn't focused on being a large volume car, rather on new innovations. Car design had been moving away from a body on frame construction to a platform design that reduced the amount of metal in the car, making it both cheaper and lighter. The new Roadster was something of a step back with a simple metal chassis. Lightweight, dent-resistant plastic body panels would be bolted onto it. These lightweight panels kept weight down, while making repairs simple. It's a technique that was used by other cars such as the Renault Sport Spider and the Smart 42. The new director of design of BMW Technic was Dr. Ulrich Bez. At Porsche, he directed the design of the 911 Turbo, so a sports car was right in his wheelhouse. He would design BMW's new car, but wouldn't stay long at BMW Technic, moving back to Porsche. He'd go on to help Dayu in the 1990s, and would eventually become CEO of Aston Martin. Initial sketches showed a sleek design. It morphed over time, and it was clear that from early on, BMW were looking at a new door design. The shape included high door sills, with the intention that the doors would slide down into the recess. This was a new car concept from New Design Studio, and it needed a standout feature to show BMW's forward thinking, but it also made practical sense. Sliding doors made more sense in tight parking spots, and ingress and egress were a doddle. Most of the car might be new, but it didn't make sense to make a new engine when BMW had existing engines that would work just fine. So the 2.5 litre six-cylinder from the 325i would be used along with its 5-speed manual gearbox. The rear suspension was brand new. To make the ultimate driving machine, BMW's engineer spent time giving the car go-kart-like handling, and with the positioning of the engine, it had near-perfect 50-50 weight balance. The shape was tuned to give it a good-ish drag coefficient. Even the silencer on the exhaust was teardrop-shaped to produce smooth airflow underneath the car. The goal was to produce low drag without reverting to spoilers or wings to produce a car with clean lines. By the summer of 1986, a running prototype was zipping along the test track. Progress had gone so well so quickly, only 12 months from the start of the project. In August 1986, BMW announced the first product from BMW Technic, the BMW Z1. Z stood for Zukunft, the German word for future, and this was BMW's futuristic statement from their new Technic team. This was, to quote the original vision of the project, freedom on four wheels. With short overhangs, this car harked back to British roadsters and of course the BMW 507. The classic kidney grille was shoehorned onto the front bumper and looked more like a toothbrush moustache. The car got a lot of interest, but the question on everyone's lips was, of course, would BMW produce it? 
BMW for their part were tight-lipped. The concept wasn't designed with production in mind and would have to be hand-built, which meant it wouldn't be cheap. Despite this, a limited run made some sense. Many open tops were sold in the USA, a lucrative market in which BMW was doing well. Impending US legislation in the 70s, which never actually came about, would have effectively banned open tops. So in the 80s, there weren't any new models. So it was a fair assumption a new open top could sell well, certainly in low numbers. And with a fierce rivalry with its other German rivals who had open top Grand Tourers of their own, increasing its range with a halo car might be a good idea. As soon as the lights went out at the Z1's unveiling, BMW started looking into Z1 limited production. But it would take until the end of 1986 until management officially agreed the Z1 should be produced. That was easier said than done. Stylists and designers can make shortcuts to make a one-off car look good and drive well, but making something that could be easily manufactured and assembled, repeatedly with precision, and easily serviced and maintained over the life of the car was another whole level of effort. The attention is often shone on the people who create the designs, but those who turn them into practical reality have just as hard a job to do. The final Z1 production car was shown at the 1987 Frankfurt Motor Show only 12 months later, and kudos should be given to the engineers who created something barely different from the original concept that hadn't been designed with production in mind at all. The interior was smart, with parts borrowed from the 3 Series, but BMW were keen to demonstrate the practicality of the lightweight plastic panels. Director of Design Ulrich Bez jumped on one, deforming it. However, unlike certain failed demonstrations, in this case the panel popped back into shape. The public loved the production Z1, especially the unique pop-up doors, and it was reputedly the most photographed car of the entire show. One German motoring magazine tried to purchase the show car for a crazy price. BMW refused, it was only one of ten cars that they'd made at that point, and they needed it for pre-production testing. Pre-orders streamed in despite the high price, almost double the cost of the present-day BMW X4. Soon the initial run of 4,000 cars was sold out, and given BMW expected to produce just six a day, it would take nearly three years to satisfy initial demand. All BMW had to do now was get it to market. By 1988, BMW announced that they had 35,000 pre-orders, leading customers to worry that they wouldn't get their cars until the millennium in 13 years' time. The large number of orders were likely due to speculative investors. The idea that customers would wait 13 years to get a car that by then would be wildly out of date seems crazy now, but demand fuels demand. We like to tell ourselves we make rational buying decisions, but the purchasing of many luxury items are based purely on emotion, and this meant pre-orders swapped hands for tens of thousands of Deutschmarks over the retail price. The open top wasn't the only design the 60-strong BMW Technic team had produced in their very productive first 12 months of existence. They dabbled with adding four-wheel drive to the chassis, along with making a more practical coupe that was closer to BMW's mass-produced cars. Although the coupe wouldn't make it to market, a similar rear-end look would appear when the Z3 open top was converted into a coupe in 1998. Production of the Z1 began in 1988, and the first customers received their cars in 1989. For a concept that hadn't been designed with production in mind, around three years from the first sketch to production was a remarkably short period of time. All Z1s were left-hand drive, BMW wasn't willing to make a right-hand drive version of the car for such a limited production run. The chassis was hot-dipped galvanised in one piece, helping prevent rust of course, but it also increased rigidity by 25%, something only the Renault Espace was doing up until this point. Metal tubing extended from the chassis into the frame of the windscreen that gave it excellent rigidity, something important when you're trying to find something to hold as you climbed in, but it also doubled as good side impact and rollover protection. The plastic bonded floor was just one piece that weighed only 15 kilograms and smoothed the airflow underneath the car. This was next generation thinking, technologies that BMW would apply to its mass produced cars, or so was the thinking at the time. Each of the plastic body panels was designed to take different kinds of impacts, which meant each had to be constructed differently. 
BMW had a tough time getting the paint to match on all the disparate panels of the car, so limited the colour choice to just red, yellow, black and metallic green. The most popular colour was of course green. Only kidding, it was red. Later on, black and violet were added, but it became clear that producing a car from plastic panels was just too hard to do on a large scale, and BMW would stick with metal body panels for their mainstream cars. Motoring magazines finally got to thoroughly test this new Wunder Auto. They found a car that was a lot of fun to drive, indeed it was probably the most fun car BMW had produced up until this point. Words like supreme driving pleasure and a textbook driver's car were bandied about. The 0-60 time of around 8 seconds was nothing to write home about, but like the MX-5, the Z1 focused on driving enjoyment rather than outright performance. The improved handling of the BMW Z1 was largely due to the new rear suspension and axle, dubbed the Z axle. It would be used on other BMW cars such as the 3 Series to great effect and help justify the cost of producing the Z1 and the work of the BMW Technic team. The Z1's standout feature were of course the doors and they worked well enough. The car could even be driven with them down, but a disappearing door needs a high sill, so good luck trying to get in and out gracefully with a tight skirt, and you weren't advised to lean on the door when getting out as it could damage the mechanism. If the door mechanism didn't work for some reason, for example a flat battery, they could be raised manually, but the weight made it quite a challenge. BMW insisted it wasn't all about the headline performance, but the handling that made the Z1 fun, but some customers wanted more. Longtime BMW collaborator Alpina offered to boost the Z1 by 30 horsepower to 200 horsepower by increasing the engine size to 2.7 litres and doing a few other tricks. This improved the 0 60 time by about a second. 66 cars were sold, and a further 8 stock Z1s were converted. BMW dabbled with their own fast version Z1M. One car was built with significant body changes, but it was never pursued. All those orders for the BMW Z1 would keep the company busy for quite a while, but new orders quickly dried up, maybe because of the introduction of the new Mazda MX-5 in 1989, a car that was as much fun as the Z1, but for a fraction of the price, and available now. The production rate of the BMW Z1 was up to about 10 to 12 cars a day, but a lot of those 35,000 pre-orders ended up evaporating, and eventually BMW produced around 8,000 cars and ended production in 1991. BMW celebrated the car in the last year of its production with a Z1 art car. But despite limited sales, BMW weren't worried. Profits weren't in limited production cars, they were in mass manufacturing, and the Z1 had produced useful technology, like the Z-axle, that could be applied to mainstream cars. It had also provided a halo car that got BMW a lot of attention, which helped them sell their main cars, helping to justify the cost of making their innovative sports car. In any case, the Z1 proved that there was a market for a luxury open top, if it could be made for a price closer to the MX-5. The lessons from the Z1 were applied to the mass-produced Z3, which was based on the 3 Series to save development and production costs. But the spiritual successor to the Z1 would surely be the 1998 Z8, also designed to evoke the 1950s BMW 507. The Z1 was BMW pushing the technical boundaries, trying something new, and they certainly succeeded. It created a lot of excitement around the brand while showing their technical prowess. The BMW Technic Group that had started the project would go on to work on new technologies such as hybrid drivetrains, steer-by-wire, brake-by-wire, heads-up displays, all packaged in wacky and not-so-wacky packages. They even produced another Roadster concept, the Z29, developed in 2001 but shown in 2006. Yes, the pop-up doors were a bit gimmicky, and the fact it's not been repeated shows it wasn't the most practical solution. But if you look beyond those doors, the Z1 made a lot of sense for BMW. It was a halo car that showed their customers they were looking to the future, and it tested new technologies like the Z-axle that went into future cars. It truly was, as the BMW Technic brief said, freedom on four wheels. There's more to the history of sliding car doors, including this funky design in the video on the right. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.